point. Cool. Welcome, everybody. So we have got eight awesome pre or seven awesome presentations coming up today from the guys of the data school. Uh, I believe, are we kicking off with you, Sasha? Or who's yeah. kicking off? Sasha's kicking off, first of yeah. all. So this project was all about quantified self and using the Moves app to come up with some interesting data sets and then looking at how, first of all, you need to manipulate that data and potentially alter it, and then how do we then play that into Tableau and come up with some cool visualizations that tell some good stories off the back of what the guys have captured with their Moves app. So at that point, we're going to throw it over to Sasha and let her kick off and see what she's come up with. Okay, so hello everybody, my name is Sasha, and uh, that's Sorry, one my moment. screen <laughs> yeah. anymore. Uh, yeah, so I didn't know what the Moves app was either until like before Andy said, please install it, we will do a project on it, and uh, I, I was quite skeptical at first because it's tracking absolutely every step you make, everywhere you go, and I don't know, why would you want that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then I investigated a little bit more and I noticed that uh, in their website they say, oh, it replaces health monitors and uh, things like it gets you motivated to move more. And uh, well, I was wondering why, and uh, basically it's because it counts your calories. Uh, but uh, the idea of people counting calories hasn't been like a popular thing since uh, forever. Does anybody know how, how long this has been happening and why? Why do people count their calories? Because they can. <laughs> because people are worried about what the foods actually yeah. contain what, so yes, I think most people know that going to McDonald's is bad, but not necessarily how bad. Okay, okay yeah, but this app is actually um, counting just uh, how much you burn, not how much you eat. True. And it doesn't uh, take into account like who you are, <laughs> your BMI, like you're a man, woman. So whatever, uh, I went into a different uh, side of the Moves app, not into the health aspect of it, which is actually what it's made for. Uh, so what I did is a green journey through time, just uh, looking at distances, the speeds, and just uh, a typical week for a person in seven days. Yeah. So in my dashboard, we have uh, a slider to see the animation and it takes you through a path of seven days, the timeline of a running man, the running total that this man covers over a seven-day week period, and if you hover over the diagram, it also shows you the weather forecast for that particular day, and the speedometer tells you like how fast it goes. Just gonna run it now. And that is what a uh, week in an anonymous person's life looks like. <laughs> no, it wasn't my data. But yeah, that's how far I go with the Moves app. Any questions? I love the little running man across the bottom. <laughs> it's a show. That's really cool. Why does it change the position? The like the faded the faded man like there's a it's just uh, like yeah. There's the black man, there's like this, the weird guy, and these weird guys don't have the same position. Just an course. animation effect. That's cool. It's <laughs> just showing in history. Yeah. But that's with the activity of one. There are like, okay. like it's cool. Do it. What happens okay, with your average so speed chart on the side? Because that kind of gets. Average speed chart. Because um, the numbers are sometimes there and then it kind of selects itself out. Seemingly. Which one do you So mean? your little dial on the right hand side. The, the speedometer. All oh, right. Um, Can you just play it again, actually, just so everyone yes, can see it. It's quite cool. So basically, uh, the reason why it fades out at some point is 
because there isn't a value oh. for every point. Sorry. Okay. Um, so there is some, but not for all. Right. Okay. Cool. So what did the dashboard tell you? The dashboard told me that this person uh, does mostly walking every day, uh, more walking than taking transport, but the distance that he or she covers is like a lot more by transport, obviously. Okay. Um, so if you could add one more data item <coughs> to add something else to your visualization, what would you have? Uh, just from the router. Oh, from where? Oh, well, I was trying to get the percentage of the total distance okay. to do a cumulative value, so increase per day. But um, yeah, I couldn't get it to work. Okay, sounds like some fun calculations. Cool. Yeah. Anyone else got any questions or session? No. Quietly sitting there thinking, okay, what do I to this? Start with. All right, cool. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you. All right, who's up next? Next one. Me. Next. Okay, Alex. <coughs> Have we got the chat window up just in case anyone's got any questions that come in as well? Sorry. Nobody's oh. Next. Then there's James and Clay right Ashron, now. so you can see me the chat right here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Right. So uh, my one was uh, I was going to take Tim's data and uh, Andy's moves data. As a, the, the moves app data that I got wasn't quite enough really to do much with. Um, and try and see if I could link it with some congestion and pollution data in London and just uh, try and blend uh, a lot of it together and see if I could, uh, if Tim and Andy were going through particularly polluted or, or congested areas in London and whatnot. But um, I say we'll, we'll see how far. Unfortunately, I didn't quite get as far as uh, I was sort of hoping to in, in the five days. So uh, I think one of the big challenges was actually trying to blend the data. But um, I'll, I'll show you what I've got So the first thing I just wanted to show quickly was uh, was just my Alteryx workflow. So uh, I boxed up quite a lot of it because there's quite a few different data sources, and uh, I think this is something uh, in hindsight I probably would have looked to have reduced. Uh, perhaps <laughs> make it a little bit easier at this stage. But um, one thing I thought I'd just bring up actually, uh, was, it was mentioned this morning when we were doing our advanced spatial analytics, was so most of our data was in lat long, which uh, we were happy to deal with. But um, Craig mentioned this morning um, sometimes, particularly when you're dealing with UK government data, it comes in North Inks and East Inks rather than lat long. And uh, so at first I did try looking up. The equation for it, wondering if there was one, and uh, after about five minutes of all stuff, then it sounds Chris Love, and he told me just like that. So, uh, <laughs> in conclusion, uh, just ask, ask Chris Love. Ask Chris Love, yes. We'll so, all be in there, yeah, much, much easier. But I just thought I'd just show, uh, anyway, it's a very quick fix. So if you've got your data here, so this is my London traffic data, uh, I've just deselected a few things that I wasn't particularly interested in, and then using the create spatial points. Go in there. Uh, I've put in my East Ings, as my East field, um, the Northing is my Y field, and then normally it's this top field, fields is like long, which is usually selected, but because we've got East Ings and North Ings, so I'll just select it like it was a default. It's probably not going to work out. So instead, uh, just click fields, our projected field points, and I click on these three little dots at the end here, and then I just scroll to the top. Uh, under projected coordinate systems is national grids, uh, British national grid. So you just click on that and it just uh, it converts North Things and East Things to that long. So it's just a very quick, easy fix for everyone in case you didn't know that one. You probably did. So. Um, and then Union, I've got some uh, various different data here for different types of pollutants. And I've unioned them together and then tried to join it with the site data, which has got my that long. 
Uh, and then these are my other ones. Uh, so I've got Andy's moves data, Tim's moves data, and then my traffic data, which I've uh, tried to all put into Tableau. But uh, yeah, as I discovered, trying to blend all that was actually uh, quite tricky. <laughs> so, uh, Where was your transport data from? And the carbon monoxide? So the this data, the pollutant data, was from the DEFRA website, so okay. the Department of whatever Environmental, and um, and then the this one was from I think uh, the again it was government transport data, so uh, I think it was Department of Transport, but okay. there's one main government ones. So. Cool. Uh, and then Tableau. So, whoops, I've still got the right thing loaded up. There you go. So, it's so um, I've just sort of tried to. The pollution data, unfortunately, although there was tons of it, was only measured in a handful of sites. So, uh, putting on a spatial graph doesn't do, doesn't really do it justice. But I thought it'd be fun just to sort of, uh, if you can zoom in, just sort of based on how well we know London. Um, look at a few sites um, using the timeline just sort of see how it uh, compares um, and then bottom left here I've got these various pollutants you can see the carbon monoxide one uh, does dwarf the other one so I've then just got rid of it for this graph on the right um, but at least carbon monoxide is coming down drastically so uh, uh, one of the sneaky things was actually the units they had so this was in milligrams per meter cubed and these were all in micro so all the, the units were all quite similar when you first look at them, but uh, sort of sneaky put that on. So had to adjust for that. For that. Um, and then so going sort of along the timeline really, so we've got size here as order, um, and it's sort of difficult really just for the lack of different sites to sort of see a trend as we go through the years. So in conclusion, a few more sites would be uh, perhaps gives a better thing. But what about congestion? Uh, a bit more data for congestion more sites so this is an awful lot of the main roads in London and the this is the sort of average uh, amount of traffic going along many of these roads in a, in a year um, and obviously the bigger in the case most so the, the main circles are around this sort of inner, inner London ring road which I think goes around this sort of area here and you see actually in the right in the middle in the city of London and sort of west it's fairly low on congestion um, and again, I'm sort of trying to be consistent. I've sort of broken down the main measures here. Um, but again, this one was uh, the cars and taxis were so big, so I had to get rid of that one. Um, so it's sort of interesting to see if it's just very much by time, particularly I think 2003 is when the congestion charge comes in. So, but it's, it's not, as we go through, it's not really a great uh, change through 2003. Um, I thought it would be interesting to see if around here, Stratford, when the Olympic Games starts, if there's much more congestion, but it's just busy as always by the looks of it. So, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's that's about it really. So London's busy and it's very polluted. <laughs> so you, you said in both your charts it was quite difficult to see the change mm -hmm. in what was actually going on. Mm -hmm. So do you think a map was actually the best way to show with the symbols on the map? Um, I was just trying to sort of, I guess, give perspective. And um, but my, the, my original brief was I wanted to, uh, it all started with friends were telling me if you compare the pollution by the river versus, say, a main road 100 yards from the river, it's quite drastically different. So I wanted to see if I could measure that. But um, yes, it's, yes, I think something like a scatter graph or a, um, uh, something else is probably the best way to okay. illustrate the difference. But uh, uh, I was just interested to see if there was a sort of spatial differential around that sort of main or whatnot. So what would you have done if you had more time or additional data sets? Would you have gone deeper into that question? And... That, that would have been something. I um, wanted to get Tim and Andy's uh, moves data involved. Um, so and, and I would like to have blended them. So the, the real thing I wanted to do um, was sort of do a scatter graph of having sort of pollution versus um, congestion yeah. and then whether it's time as, as your sort of detail or, or sites making up the actual figures, so that would have been taken actually up by them. So with the moves data, were you basically going to say it was Tim or Andy to blame for the congestion, for actually being in the congestion? Uh, um, that could have been something, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool, no, that's good. It is a tough one. I, I really like what you did with uh, carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. When it's really dominant within a chart, loads of people will have just taken it out and actually ignored it from the overall perspective. Mm -hmm. I like the way that you did the chart without it. 
But what I would do is just make sure your labeling is clear, just so somebody picked up your dashboard that they see that within the titles okay. so that that's come out. But no, that's cool. Brave, very brave on the, the amount of data you're taking in from multiple public data sources. Yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was experience. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Cool. All right, thank you, Alex. So, people on the phone, if you've got any questions, feel free to drop them into the chat window. If not, we will uh, keep rolling with whoever's next. Me. Emily, cool. Over to you. Let me know when you're ready. Um, I should be on. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, here we go. Thank <laughs> you, sorry. I forgot about the password. Hi, can everyone see my screen? Not yet. We should see it on the screen if we see the screen. Okay. There we go, we have all tricks. All right, so. Okay. So, hi, my name's Emily. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I did something slightly different. Um, I didn't use Moves data. Instead, I went out to a friend. She uh, was an avid runner a couple of years ago, and so she had like two years worth of running data on her. And, I, and so I'm just like, this is amazing because I have all this data about her heart rate and um, how fast she ran, how, how far she ran, the, the different types of intervals that she was able to go through. So I wanted to kind of take that and see what we can learn from it. Um, the second part about that was um, she also happens to live in a very inclement place. She lives in Calgary, Alberta. So it gets to like minus 40 in the winter. And she did some of her training in the winter. So I blended that against weather data to see whether or not she still trained despite these crazy conditions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through two Alteryx workflows. Um, the reason is because um, initially all of us were working with, uh, I think, KML files, and I did as well. But what I found was that when I, when I imported it via a KML file, it was incredibly difficult to parse. And I've, I've written an article about how to then parse such difficult things. But then I talked to uh, Chris about this, and he's like, no, no, just go with the GPX file. It is much, much cleaner. And it, re it really was. And so I'm just going to talk about the GPX file, because uh, at the end of the day, it was able to plot for me the latitude and longitude at several points. And the Garmin tool that she used, the watch, um, actually updated like every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, you're able to plot where she's on the path. Cool. So from an accuracy perspective, and if I were to do this again, don't bother with the KML file, just go straight for the GPX file. Um, so that made my workflow actually much easier just because um, it, it came out much cleaner. So I, I really got to spend a lot of my time um, <coughs> prepping data against the weather data that I found online. And going through this exercise, I found that I have become really good at converting date metrics into other date metrics and parsing out date metrics so they can all complete, so we can all blend together. And so you'll notice in my containers, it's all about converting date data for the, to blend against the weather data. Um, one other thing that I had to do uh, was in order for me to calculate distance and using the great circuit, great circle formula, I had to create another column to essentially calculate the distance. So if you think about the first latitude, what is the second latitude? But that technically has to be a second field. And I was able to then use the multi-role formula and be like, oh, if it's, uh, if it's, if latitude is greater than zero, which it pretty much always will be, then give me the latitude that's negative one. So it'll always give me the one value that's supposed to be before it. So I found that was really trippy for me because I'm generally really terrible at coming up with if statements. So this was a really big knowledge learning moment for me. Sure. Um, after that, I have my data ready to go. 
and I pushed it into Tableau. Let's see if it'll work. Hmm. Yes. Yes, I'm still sharing. Why is it not updating? Just take that. Okay. Hmm. Take that much. That's kind of strange. Yeah. Upload King of Go to LinkedIn. Yeah. Oh, here we go. There we go. Okay, Weird. so this is my friend Brittany. <laughs> and what I've done is, uh, what I've asked you to do is select a bar within Does She Train When It Snows to see Brittany's training guide and running conditions. So if you click on one of these bars, it's one of her training sessions, and what it should do is that it should update the path in which she ran that particular time. I swear it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see in this current visualization, she's running in negative 20, and she's run 15 kilometers. She's not. Yeah, she, she's crazy. Yeah. And so this is the route that she took. She ran 15 kilometers in negative 3. And I also created a parameter where we can adjust for rain. So you'll... I thought this was kind of cute, the fact that um, well, you'll see it soon. Um, when the parameter changes, the symbol should also change. So when it rains, you have a little rain cloud. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's really interesting that, you know, for, uh, and I, I plotted speed on here, is that, you know, she's running a lot still. She's running still pretty fast, and it's still raining considerably. So I feel like in this journey that she's taken, she's been very persistent. I haven't talked to her in like a year. And this is pretty much <laughs> the most updated I, that I know about her. <laughs> um, and that's kind of about it. Yeah. Cool. I really like the mapping. The mapping's done up really nicely. Yeah. With the link through to the runs. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, Def, I shout out to Craig for help on this. <laughs> Last night, I spent hours looking for different ways. I mean, I was like, Google API, download this HTML, put this key in, why isn't the key working? And then, oh, it's totally broken. And I, I went into the whole find background image, and when I put the background image on it, the, it looked like she was running through buildings because it wasn't it wasn't mapping <laughs> properly. And so finally, uh, Craig showed us this way to, to map where you know, it's obviously mapping correctly, but even better, it's it's a live extract, I think. So that means that the data is even more accurate and um, more dynamic. Cool. Yeah. I really like how you've mixed in the weather. I think that's a really cool thing to, to flow in with this. Yeah, I think that um, it, it really says a lot about, like, the context of kind of the result. <laughs> Because yeah. it's not just the distance, you're running against the conditions that you're in. Um, what I would do with your um, lines on your bar chart, you kind of lose quite a lot of the context. And I often find this with diverging color sets, um, that you just get a lot of gray, that your middle pacing whatever, with whatever you're doing, so your middle results often come up gray. And that tells you one thing. But sometimes I find that using stepped color, I don't know if you've come across that yet, in your edit colors can Especially when you've got a uh, five kph, three to nine kph. Yeah. You've almost got like a perfect five steps that you could use there, or six steps yeah. of your colors, and that might come out just a little bit stronger just to show that variation in speed. But yeah, love the use of the little custom shapes. I think that's awesome and very fun. Uh, and yeah, and I think that's one that's a really nice little dashboard that works well. And what a way to catch up with your friends. <laughs> I haven't spoken to you for a while, but I now know you. I now know you so well. Yeah, very <laughs> cool. I like it a lot. Good stuff. What on it? Number four? Yeah. You see how that just stands yeah. out that a little bit more? He really does, yeah. Because there's not. Yeah, I, I find it a challenge, especially when you use certain. Um, Certain color sets from certain partners and companies that we'll go right. and work with, but sometimes the yeah. color sets are quite oh, washed out. It gets harder to use the. Oh, that's, color, so that's a good way to get around that. Uh, can anyone send me the number? Is the number always the same? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um.
Do you want to skip on to somebody else first, and then we'll come back to Damiana? Uh, yeah, sure. If yeah. anyone wants to take my place. Well, then, my turn. Yeah. Number five. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, one moment, I don't see the. Oh, here. So, here is um, my dashboard with the title if you don't like where you are, move, you are not a tree. <laughs> and what I made is to join the the moves record of the last uh, couple of months, more or less with also some information of my Fitbit search because moves in Android, I don't know why it doesn't um, count calories. It doesn't in iPhone, but I think that it doesn't in Android. So I joined it uh, for some analysis with uh, the data from Fitbit. This time in Android, my workflow was pretty, pretty, pretty simple. <laughs> Just to clean it a little bit and prepare all the data, uh, parse everything and make the, the spatial points and um, I'm preparing the, the file to, to tap with. And then for the visualization, I create uh, two dashboards. In the first one, you have um, a calendar of all the days that I have information from the Moves app. So you can choose the day and you will see concretely the, uh, the route that day and the walking in places, transport and cycle information will be updated with uh, that day. And here you have also a global visualization of these two months with the distance traveled excluding flights because I have uh, some flights during these two months from Madrid to London, from London to the Canary Islands. So you can, for example, um, see here that I was in Madrid. <coughs> and well, you will see the route updated, colored by the hour of the day. So in blue will be uh, during the morning and in red during the, the afternoon. So you can see more or less the path during the day from here, that here is where I was living in Madrid, and all the route during the day. And for example, you could filter and see only when I was walking or what was in trust. And that for uh, the rest of the days. So for example, um, this was the day that I travel more, but basically because the main distance was in transport, but I was in car in the Canary Islands. And here, what was it? Well, we'll see. Well, and here I was in London, and you can see all the same for every day. And in the second step, in the second visualization, is where I join the data from Fitbit to see the relation between the steps made in every day and the calories burned, and also the steps made and the uh, sleep time in seconds. Okay, we have here uh, a little guide for the sleep time in seconds to know how, how many hours uh, it would be. And the, and the functionality is almost the same. You can, for example, see, the, well, also, it's colored by what Fitbit uh, records as very active minutes. And the size will be the total distance of that day. So for example, uh, here, that is a day with a very high number of active minutes. It's Carl, I think you remember, you, you remember he yeah. was our basketball training session. <laughs> and well, you can see also the correlation between uh, both variables. And this is it.
So you got less sleep because you came to play basketball, but it was also one of your more active days. Yeah. That was me telling you weren't running around enough. I'm sorry, Pat. <laughs> That's really cool. I really like both those dashboards, actually. They're really good. Can you just go back to your um, yeah. daily global? I think that is such a great dashboard. I really like that. So great use of the calendar and tableau. Well done for learning how to build that. It's a sneaky one, but a good little tip. So for anybody on the phones or even in the room who doesn't know how to build that, Download Pablo's dashboard or Tableau Public that I'm sure you're going to put up there afterwards. Yeah, sure. And have a look at that because that's a really nice little technique to use. Um, I really like your chart in the top right. So using the area chart behind is that, um, yeah, percentage of total distance yeah. throughout the day. The running total, yeah. So you kind of see where you've had those steep parts of activity, which you're kind of seeing from the, the bar chart in front, but it still works quite nicely alongside. Uh, yeah, no, that's really cool. I love the fact that the maps are zooming into different places, mm -hmm. and you've actually just chosen the time when you were in Corsica and Madrid and London. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, that's really useful that you've got you've captured the time period where you're pretty active and in, in around some pretty iconic places. Mm -hmm. So that works quite nicely too. So yeah, it's really good. I really like that. Thank and you. I like your scatter plots on the next chart. Have you got auto? Um, or recalculating trend lines. So if you select a couple of the marks, does your trend line change? Or sorry, does your trend line change if you? No, I, I turn them off. Yeah. It, well, it shows the no, it changed. Yeah, it does change. Change. Yeah, 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 I didn't change it. I changed the average. So the average with the dark lines didn't change when you select one or select more of one. Yeah, but, but didn't change the. Trend lines. Yeah, because I think if you've built this up over a longer period of time, so you have more plots, uh -huh. um, I'd definitely look to use transparency a bit more. Uh -huh. um, but then it'd be really interesting to see how those trends change as you select above average behavior and to see what that time period was. Um, so pairing that up with maybe something shown over time. Mm -hmm. So you get that the idea of how some, how your behavior is changing over time, as well as then what your activity actually is within that. That'd be really cool. But yeah, two really nice dashboards, and really cool, both of them. Thing. Um, just as I didn't come up with them. Well played, Pablo. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for anyone else around this? Yeah, yeah. The hour thing. These? Your hour time slot goes from blue to red from you know, midnight to midnight. Where is it? Oh, so yeah. That's a nice sort of thing. If yeah, you were... it, it was the only way I, I found to. Um, it doesn't work right now. Oh. It was work, for example, these because the moves uh, up. Uh, doesn't record very well the, the hours. So, for example, here you see it's like almost the same hour of the day. Well, this was also a wedding, so <laughs> I spent right here like 12 hours. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but um, one, why doesn't it show the points, the map? Can you just take some more? No. With the other one, what if it comes? Well, this one is also with. Oh, I don't know why it doesn't work right now. It's quite. It's very weird. But yeah, I, I like the color coding mm -hmm. of the hour as well because mm -hmm. it's quite interesting. It's yeah, it was, it was the only way to show more or less the the path. You know, like I started here and and uh, meal time I was here and at night. That's a pretty good hack. Really neat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to ask if if you were say a student. Your body clock was you know, <laughs> more towards midnight to midnight. Maybe a question for you as well. Yeah. Uh, would it be easy to sort of change the blue red shading? So uh, I don't know. So I mean, like here, blue's great because it shows blue's morning, red's in the afternoon. But, uh, if you still had midnight to midnight, is it quite easy to change the shading? To well, you, you could do a calculation to add six on or something like that. So your hours would revert back, and then as soon as you get to 24, flip that round to be a different AM time, yeah. per se. But you could show hours of my day. So I wake up at 7 and I go to bed at 11. Or if you're a student, I wake up at 1 o'clock in the afternoon yeah. and go to bed at 3 a.m. You could change, you could do a calculation to switch that around. And in that case, trying to work out how the colors would still be controlled, you'd probably want a different number underneath from what you're actually showing your user. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. And that's a nice little trick for dashboards. Show the person who's consuming your dashboards the clear thing that we understand in everyday language of the zero hour through to 24 or you know, midnight to midnight, 
but then actually have a calculation sitting behind the scenes that's doing something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you hand that over to somebody else as a client, that gets a little bit harder and more confusing. But yeah, no, that you could twist it around to, yes, my normal day starts at this time of the day and works better. That's also very cool. But yeah, cool. Good piece of work. So, 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 so. Damiana? Yep. Still on my computer. Good. Hi, everyone. Um, Damiana here, and I don't like fitness, so I didn't do any of those like fitness, walking, running stuff. <laughs> also, most did not work for my phone, so I took um, Chris data. He was very kind to share it with me. And I'm going to start now by showing um, what I've done and then show you actually what was the result of that. So as I said, I'm not into fitness at all. So I thought, why could you use spatial information to do something a bit different? which was maybe talking about the places where Chris went to, rather than talking about how Chris got to X, Y, and Z. So I started by pulling his data from, um, from moves, is the top part of the workflow, and then I added some coordinates uh, about the castles in England. Uh, which I, there are plenty of files over the internet with longitude and long, latitude and longitudes for all sorts of interesting places across the whole world. But I thought I would shrink it with a, to a subset that was the Castles of England. So basically, um, yeah, with the workflow, I started just by extracting date, time, uh, date and time from the from the moves file. Then I've created spatial, then I broke down the lines into points. I've created latitude and longitudes from the spatial points that they could go into Tableau. I've created a sequence here so that Tableau would know how to order all the lines. Then all of this turned out useless because I didn't use it, but it was interesting to learn how to, learn to use it. <laughs> I didn't know at the beginning. Uh, from the bottom file, I had to do the opposite because I had latitude and longitude, uh, but I had to create a spatial object. So I used the create point that takes latitude and longitude and create a spatial object. Once I had both spatial objects, what I did was to use the find nearest point to actually find the nearest castles out of my list of all castles from England to the places where Chris had been. And from there, I basically split the data set in two, um, one, with, one with the activities from Chris, the one with the activities, uh, and one with the castles, because otherwise it would be, um, otherwise the blog would not be able to separate latitude and longitude. Also, Tableau does not work with two sets of coordinates. So basically, you need to have one set of coordinates and some way of telling them apart. So this is what I've done here, which was actually Chris said, yeah, I'm not going to take any credit for this one. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've, I've then created a field, which was called type for each data set. And basically, here, it just said Chris, it was just a formula for um, this, uh, this field set, Chris Travels. And this field that was called type here, but said uh, castle instead. Then I put the, together the two data sets and just output them to Tableau, uh, to the workbook. And this is what I came up with. So basically, it's you know a Tableau-friendly slide size version of a um, of a guide to English <laughs> castles, basically. <laughs> Uh, there is the picture, there is the name, some information, can you access it, when was it made, what's the condition, uh, some interesting facts, because you know, we all love quirks about, uh, <laughs> we all love quirks about England, you know, we know it's, it's the quirkiest country ever, so. Uh, and then, as you follow along, you can, you can actually see all the places where he's been, like here, for example, then you change, then you can see the other castle, and you can follow you can follow along, changing the dates, and follow Chris across all the places he went, and then look at all the castles. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so yeah, it, it was it was fun. It was lots of fun. Like here, there's Cardiff, Penhall. I'm basically like you can go back and forth and and play with this one. It's a bit of an interactive 
60 seconds guide uh, <laughs> to the castles in England. And it was, as I said, another way of looking at spatial information. In fact, just couldn't be bothered to do any sort of health stuff running. What do I know about that? That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I just so, yeah. the castles data set alone is really good. The yeah. fact that you've then, uh, did Chris visit any castles at any point? I don't know, I haven't asked him. It's a good question. You shouldn't ask him, you should find out just his data. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting to no, see the picture uh, of Chris pop up in front of like, the castle. But the thing is that I've, the, the distance was um, within a five kilometer range. Okay. So some of the some of the some of the time it was really close, some of the time it was. But I have to admit, like I was I wasn't so interested in knowing if he had actually oh. been there. <laughs> it was just the excuse, you know. I love how you've had Chris as the conqueror of the castles, going around each of them, just taking them over and like. There you go. That that could, that could be the other way. I'm sure he's gonna like your explanation way better. Than Can I just say I really love your dashboard. Really clean, very nicely designed. <laughs> love the use of the image. Thank you. I love the interesting facts, especially I didn't ever know that the Tower of London we kept a polar bear or something. It was it was awesome. Like they had all sorts of things in there. They had some sort of menagerie and like throughout the centuries they had all sorts of weird stuff. I so, don't know. The what was your data source for the castles again? Uh, well, I took the coordinates from, from a website that basically provides GPS coordinates okay. for sort of English and then the, the heritage size for all the information Sweet. and then I've got the heritage size into the coordinates. Okay. And Very good. I really like it. Thank you. I, like, I don't know. I spent like two hours today trying to change the, the design mm -hmm. because, okay, I want to make it clean, but I don't know if this is way too boring. That was that was the look boring? without. That, I I don't know. Like I'm wondering. I'm looking at it. And it's like are people going to fall asleep while they look at it? No, because so so I had a conversation with Robert Casera at the um, Tableau conference after he finished his talk about presenting data visualization of stories, and I I kind of went down the lines of well you can have the story just saying exactly what you found and giving that kind of clean snapshot if you want to, but what about the explorative dashboards? You know. And he said, oh, it's a spectrum. And actually, the closer you get to the, or, you know, you want to be either one side or the other. And I said, is that true? You know, I, I only your strong visualization is going to be at one side or the other. And that's why this isn't particularly telling the answer. It's not that static. It's just here. You know, Chris visits these three castles and click here to find some information about it. It's kind of this crossover between the two. And I quite like it, which is why, maybe why you're getting, a, not frustrated is probably the overly strong word, but just kind of, I don't know if I like it, I don't know if I do, because you're kind of not saying it's this, but you're also not kind of saying, oh, go on, just go and play. But you are kind of saying, you're very close to the just go and play part, and I love go and play dashboards. So I think this is just a really kind of fun way to go and look at English heritage. Peter Jokes did a, um, a visualization on all of the monarchy <laughs> at the UK uh, just before, uh, it's about April or March time last year, or this year, sorry. And that was really cool, because it was just, allowing you to dig through the monarchy and finding out some weird facts about them, a little bit of history, how long they reigned for, and all of that stuff. And that's not a, you can just look at it and just take the message in one foul swoop, like we're looking at with some of the charts this week. This is much more around, I'm going to play around with and see what I can dig out from here. I think you've nailed that really nicely. You've kept it clear. Normally, when I create exploratory visits, I kind of put too much in them. And I think that's the danger that, because once I show you this, you might also want to know this and this. But when you look at that, you want to know this. And so you have to be really careful with that. So I think you've actually avoided that trap and you've created something really nice and clean there. But at the same time, it's created something that's actually really useful and fun. Mm -hmm. cool. Anyone else got any other questions? Nope. No? Cool. Thank you. Good work. Say, I didn't, I've seen you, you looking at the castle websites so many times this week, and I never asked you once why you were doing it. <laughs> I'm kind of disappointed with that, so bad time for me. So very good. <coughs> Can we just check the chat just to make sure there's no That's questions fine. that are flying? No? Cool. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Pablo. <laughs> Who's next? Nico. Okay, so yeah, this was my first data set, and I didn't have anything about calories, about nothing. I just had points, 
lines, walking, transport, the name of the points, and the duration, basically. So nothing else. So they were what I'm gonna show. And the only thing that I came up with is a diary. So a diary of my first month in London, which is interesting because it's like the moving of an Italian <laughs> to London. So what do you have to do for moving here? Well, I will start the animation and you will follow my steps from Rome to London. We start our journey or my journey in Rome. So yeah, uh, this, is, this is me transporting, of course, with a scooter because in Rome everybody runs a scooter. <laughs> and that's me in a park, which is named Villa Torronia, as you can see in the tooltips. And then this is my home. This is my home, very next to St. Peter's in Rome. And this is my university, where I went for the last arrangement for my dissertation, which was last week, actually. Then I went to the hospital just for some checkup, controls, and this kind of stuff before leaving. And then I went to Rome in London. This home actually was a temporary home because I lived in a student hall for the first for the first days. Then I had a picnic for my girlfriend's birthday in Amsterdam, and then I went back to home, just in time for the next day going for my national insurance number. And I applied to the national insurance number, and then I went for the uh, bank account, which was the second task. Bank account, I went to Elephant and Castle, to a TBC branch that refused to open my bank account, so I went back to home, and then I took the wrong bus, and then <laughs> in Fifth Street, I finally got my bank account. So yeah, very happy. And the next day, I started theta school. So my life, I will speed up the next week because it's mostly home and data school, home and data school, home and data school. <laughs> and then I started flat hunting. So this is the first home, the second home, the third home, the fourth home. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to find the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and as you can see, it's like it's fun because it's like a, a circle around the data school because I don't want to live too far. And <laughs> okay, finally I went to the agency because I found a home. So a home pop up on the screen because yeah, that's my home. So the first day I went to Disco for making just some garbage, and I then started oh. And then I started going to the conference, the Tableau conference, which is this one. And this is the data night out. So yeah, this was a really fun period. Then I had a walk, a fun walk, and then I went back to Rome, just because I had to graduate myself <laughs> to, the other, <laughs> to the other place of my university. Then I came back and I walked straight into the school. Then I went to Stonehenge <laughs> just for a, for a walk and uh, yeah to Bath, which is pretty cool. So this is my yeah this is my first month in London. So amazing and cool. Awesome. Um, so good. Wow, what do I start? I love the iconography. That's really yeah, nice. All about that. So have you loaded? How have you done that? Custom shapes? Stop. Yeah, it's custom shape, but in order to do that, the problem is that I wanted to <coughs> highlight some places, like the house hunting stuff or my home, and I didn't want to highlight this point, for instance, which means nothing. Okay. So what I did in our tricks, uh, yeah, I first parsed and prepared my data, and okay, then I split the points and the lines, and I forgot about the lines, just preparing something, but the point, I joined the point with some uh, new points, like the wrong bus, because okay. it wasn't a real point, because I just jumped off and jumped on the right bus, so uh, moves didn't, didn't plot a point there, so I did with, um, with okay. annotate mark on the map, and I joined that, and then I created this other file with my personal, my, my personal places and my personal location name. Yeah. because otherwise moves didn't have them. And then I created an importance, let's say, field, which is a number from one to five, in order to control the shapes of the tableau. So if we go here in London, for instance, the, the shapes, they are just, just the, 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 the thing I want, 
and these are like importance five, so that the shapes is bigger. Okay. And yeah, and this is just not important, so you don't <laughs> notice these points that, that don't exist. Very good. Yeah, that's it. It was pretty fun. <laughs> I love it. I love the design. Very fun. Um, so a, a way to kind of play the dashboard, play animation, but still tell the story. So this isn't an explorative one. It's explorative for yeah. you going to London, finding lots of flats, apparently, which apparently you're quite choosy about where you live, Nico. Okay? Uh, <laughs> well. <laughs> or maybe not. That's the issue. They were terrible. They were okay. <laughs> Fancy but hell. Yeah, welcome to <laughs> London. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so no, that's really cool. I really love the story behind it. And then, yeah, I think the narration helps over the top. Um, but if not, what I was going to say was, so somebody was looking at this on the web, what you might want to have is just clean your tool tips up a little bit. Mm -hmm, yeah, sure. So as they're clicking through, because on the server we won't get the animation per se, but if you can get the tool tip to tell your story a little bit more, uh, you could say, at this time on this day, I then went to, and because you kind of got the right names in there already, you haven't had to alias things, you've kind of voted that data in. That's really nicely. So you could you could actually clean your tooltip up to be that helpful part when you're not there to tell the story to get someone to tell it. But that is a great use of spatial data. I, I really like that you can use the maps as well, like the zoom in maps. For Rome, Stonehenge is hilarious because I've been on a few road trips where we've gone past it, round and back out. <laughs> and that's about it. But no, that's really cool. Very, very good. I'll double round. Nice stuff. Any questions for anyone else? Nope. Anyone else jealous of Nico's design skills? I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Very good. Where are you, Ravi? I'm here. Last but definitely not least, are we about to see a lot of transport between Ipswich and London? Oh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Amongst other things. So this is when it's finally useful to actually commute between London and Ipswich every day when you've got to do spatial Stuff page like of this. some kind. Okay, so following that's going to be fun. Um, so I, just a caveat here, I haven't been able to play with the dashboarding or anything as much as the other guys since um, my data was actually done in my eyes um, at about two o'clock today. Um, and it is now four o'clock. So I've not had long on this, but I'll explain why. Um, the reason where I started was here. Uh, with this really messy dash um, Ultrix flow, which started with this KML file here. <laughs> now, if, you, if we had a look at this, you'd see um, two columns and in a lot of data that I really I was excited to get my hands on um, until I started messing around with it. Um, this flow um, works through uh, each step, splitting out my walking, my transport, my cycling, uh, and the place uh, names, as well as the calories, steps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's quite a rich data set. Um, but I'm a bit OCD, so what I ended up doing was putting it in containers, uh, so it looked a bit nicer. And then what I tried to do was join it with two other data sets, which I'll mention um, shortly. What I found very quickly was it wasn't behaving, it wasn't doing what I wanted it to, and the way that Altrix was interpreting the data wasn't um, as I expected it to. Um, so therefore, I started messing around with a lot of formulas, a lot of multi-row formulas to add in other context areas that I um, wanted to look into. Um, but ultimately, it was just four days of trying to get the data to behave and not really getting anywhere and starting again and trying again and starting again. So this is another version of my tidied dash, um, workflow. But what happened was I ended up with this. Uh, very simple, very straightforward uh, flow, which instead of taking the KML file, took the GPX file. The GPX file only contains the location data, but it's much more rich and takes it at uh, more frequent points rather than uh, the KML file, which seemed to take it at um, certain points and sort of as a summary of um, your journey. So after running through uh, um, with uh, it with Tim, who um, helped me with the first part, and then with Craig today, who helped me finally figure out how to, how it, um, how I was supposed to work through this, um, I, I'll then move on now to the second two data sets that I wanted to include. So I'm going to quickly refer to my dashboard, uh, which is 1,300 miles to the information lab, or how I spend my life on trains. 
<laughs> and so in order to do this, what I've done is use this website called GPS Visualizer. And what this enables me to do is use Google Maps directions and journeys and turn them into GPX files, which I can then put into Alteryx, pass out, and then play and put into Tableau. So this is, um, for instance, with this URL, what the website does, it takes the um, uh, latitude and longitude from here and plots the journey from wherever you're going to wherever you're headed. Sorry, so wherever you're coming from to wherever you're headed. Um, so let's just get back to the dashboard. So I've calculated that is it roughly uh, my journey to the information lab from when I set out from to go to university well, has been about 1,300 miles in terms of trips or length of distance I've traveled. So I studied economics at the University of Plymouth for four years. And it's not Portsmouth, as a lot of people seem to um, mix up, which Portsmouth is down here, and Plymouth is a lot further away down here. So when I mentioned, oh, I'll go to university in Plymouth, I was, oh, that's not too far. No, 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 it's really far. You get to about Exeter and you think, oh, I'm almost there, and then you have another hour. It's similar to getting to the A12 and thinking, I'm almost home. Um, so here's Ipswich, and the path that I took was, uh, this, these are car journeys that my dad took, bless him, every year for, uh, for three years to take me down to Plymouth twice a year and back. And then where I stayed on at the university was fairly close to campus in my first year, so actually across the road, which made getting up and going straight to university really, really nice and simple as I could sleep until 8.55 for a 9 a.m. lecture. And then for my second year, we found another 11-bed house, which was a bit further out, but it was nicer and bigger, and we got a cleaner once a week. So after that, I decided to take a placement year between my second and third year. And this was at BAS at PLC, which is 230 miles from home. Now, my dad was incredibly delighted at the fact that he helped to shuttle me back and forth from here as well now, uh, which is, as I, as I rightly pointed out, 100 miles less than where I'd been the year before. <laughs> so where I was at BASF, the flat that I found was, was not too far from um, where I was working, as you can see on the right-hand side, which is my commute, which I cycle to every day. It's roughly two miles to uh, work from there. And it was a fairly straightforward road. Compare that to my um, commute now. So moves um, took into account my movements for the last three weeks. And home is, as I said, Ipswich, Suffolk. And I'm ended up now at the day school in, in the centre of London, which is 85 miles from home. This is significantly um, less than where, where I've been travelling before. And um, my dad doesn't ever even have to drive me. So if we have a look at this journey here, these green lines are largely um, train journeys, um, a couple faster, a couple longer, because they seem to call it every single village between London and Suffolk. Um, and on the right-hand so right side here, you can see my activities around Ipswich. So I like to point out this little thing here, which is where I cycled and then realized I was on a national highway, realized I was going down um, an A road, which I could turn to about here. So I just got off my bike, turned around, and went back and ran away, almost. Um, but if we look into a bit more depth, my sort of activities are very much from home, cycling to the station, going to the station, and going to work. I mean, if you looked into my activities around London, apart from these outliers where I've been to the Tableau, Tableau Public um, Conference on Tuesday, and um, uh, football, which we played last week, I've not really travelled around London that much. So this is my dashboard, and one final thing I'd like to leave you on is my trip to IKEA on Sunday, um, which I will just play, um, which actually does include my um, cycle ride where I turn back. Play is just on the left. Oh yeah, somewhere. about here. <laughs> right than, this way. Yeah. So here we go, this is my cycle ride at 6 a.m. I'm gonna go up here, oh no, I've got to come back down. Um, and then I turn around and then my dad decides to go to Ikea. However, very quickly we realize that we've got the tape measure, so we come back home <laughs> and then we head off to Ikea. And that's, that's my day. Very Thanks nice. for listening, guys. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, certainly a different journey. I'm I think if you speak to anybody who's been part of the information lab for a while, we have all gone down data rabbit holes and not really ever come out the other side. <laughs> and I've still got a few projects that I still need to finish off because it's down that rabbit hole. And one day I'll come back up with an answer. 
it'll probably be just 7 or 42 or something and then carry on with my life. Um, <laughs> it's cool. I, I like the kind of overall view of the country when you've got distance, kind of almost in the way that Pablo had as well. Both of you, when you're showing distance over a long period of time, that's where maps kind of, because you just have those more geographical reference points. Kind of same with Nico and the river. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're mapping something that's just iconic, when you look at a map and you can see it, that's when maps for me come into their own. Um, so yeah, you use that really nicely. But also like your cycle ride down so off towards the A14 or something. Yeah. Just, yeah, deadly. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, no, that's good. That's a good use of it. But I think I think there's an awesome lesson to learn in knowing when to call quits on a data set as well. Mm -hmm. And you'll never ever get it spot on, right? GPX, yeah, yeah, exactly. And kind of exactly as you had with your prototype <laughs> this week. It's it's knowing when to pull the plug and just either turning around to yourself or the stakeholder and just going, it's not happening, it's not working. But I think we could do this instead. And that's kind of almost where it seems that you've got, which is is absolutely cool. And Tony grew up in Plymouth, so the perfect oh, person to pitch awesome. to. And I was born in Ipswich, so we're either end of those three lines. <laughs> Rather bizarre. Uh, thank you, Ravi. That's good. Cool. So that was done. Yep. Any questions from the phone lines? Hash has just said congratulations to all of us. Uh, oh, thanks, Hash. Thank you. Cool. We're looking forward to getting you back next week. Yeah. Groovy. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for dialing in. Um, I'm going to let these guys have a little bit of a break because it's been a, a full on week, as always. So, um, one day you guys will have a quiet week. <laughs> yeah, right. Five years' time. So, <laughs> until that point, carry on. Cool. So, thank you all. Have a good weekend, everyone on the phones. And um, I hope to see you soon at the data school. Bye. 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 Bye.